Okay. Lucky here. <laughs> right. Welcome to GSO uh, 2012. Uh, it's actually the fifth uh, workshop here, and uh, we have really a series of workshops going from 2008, when the third GSO workshop was held in Sydney. So we're uh, back to <laughs> where we started. And uh, our first uh, keynote uh, speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Gershenson from uh, uh, National University of uh, Mexico, Mexico City. And the talk will be really about the fundamentals, as uh, Peter mentioned, of uh, uh, self-organization and complexity in general, introducing some uh, new way of uh, measuring some of this phenomena. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Michael, for inviting me. Uh, all, uh, the larger part of this talk will be a paper which was just published in, in Complexity. Uh, the part of Autopoiesis is some uh, work in progress, so any, any feedback will be welcome. And also, uh, please don't see, uh, I mean, I, I want to present more the questions than the proposed answers that we're giving. Uh, I mean, we give some tentative answers, but they are uh, open for debate. Uh, I, I think that the relevant part of this talk is to pinpoint the relevant questions we, we should address in order to bring this uh, field to further progress. So I, I will give a, an introduction about the concepts I would like to cover, then the proposals for different measures and uh, at multiple scales. Then these measures will be associated <coughs> with some experiments with uh, random Buddha networks and elementary cellular automata, and then discussion of future work and conclusions. So, I mean, we all speak about complexity, but we all have different understanding of what complexity is. I, I still remember uh, my first conference on complex systems was in, in 2000, and Jack Cohen was uh, defining complexity more or less like pornography, <laughs> meaning that I, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, but <laughs> I think that still applies in spite of uh, efforts of, of multiple people. Also, more than 10 years ago, uh, Seth Lloyd uh, just came, came together with uh, like three dozen uh, measures of complexity. Uh, Bruce Edmond's PhD thesis was also on different measures of complexity. He found, I, I don't know, but dozens of different measures. So, um, I mean, of course, it's, it's not the only con problematic concept in science where we have different uh, meanings for the same word. But um, given the, the popularity and the widespread use of, of the term complexity, I think we should start bringing, um, if not a common view, to discuss what do we mean by complexity in different uh, circumstances. Because, uh, Let's say mathematicians will find one, uh, will have one definition. Biologists will have a different one, and uh, economists or social scientists will have a different one. And then, when you bring them together, they just don't understand what we're speaking about. So uh, many people have proposed to use information theory as a bridge between disciplines because basically you can describe anything in terms of information. So this is the approach we will take, and not only for complexity but also for emergence, for self-organization, for homeostasis, for autopoiesis, which are uh, concepts that are very um, pervasive in lots of different systems, but let's say we use them loosely. And, um, I mean, it's, it's not something bad. Uh, for example, in biology, uh, nobody questions the scientificness of biology, but they, they haven't come up with a agreed definition of life. So, I mean, if, if we don't have an agreed definition of complexity, that shouldn't deter us from uh, pursuing uh, complex systems research. And that also reminds me, uh, in Newton's times, uh, that Leibniz and Huygens, who were more or less rivals of Newton uh, from the continent, they, they asked Newton, well, uh, you speak so much about time, matter, and energy, why don't you define them? And Newton just said, well, I don't need to define them, for they are well known of everyone. <laughs> so, it's a bit like pornography. <laughs> but anyway, let, let, let's try to, to, to bring more clarity to the, this subject. So, uh, <coughs> Shannon defined 
information in the context of telecommunication systems, which is that nice equation. Uh, maybe, okay. can you see if I write here? values uh, on a string. Usually we speak about bit strings because that's the simplest case when you have only two difference. can be represented with zeros and ones. So uh, it, this information is defined as the negative of the sum of the probability of having one symbol times the logarithm of, of that probability. So for example, if we have some string, uh, imagine it's longer, then we just count how many ones there are in that string. So it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, and the total number of bits would be nine, so it's six over nine is one third, uh, sorry, two thirds. And this is the probability of, have, of finding a one in this string. That's the P of, of X being one. So uh, for this string, uh, that question would be, I mean, the probability of having one will be two thirds, and of course the probability of having zero is one, <coughs> and the probability of having one, which is one third. So the equation is just uh, <coughs> the negative of the sum, which would be um, two thirds <coughs> times the log in base two of two thirds. And since this is negative, that's why you put the big minus sign. And then one third, not base two of one third. And that will be the information of that string, which basically reflects how uh, how much new information a new bit gives you. So uh, the, the minimal case is when you have only ones or only zeros. So I mean that, that will give you zero information um, because let's say the, the logarithm of, of one is zero and then the probability of having the other signs uh, would be zero, so this would be zero. Uh, it means that if, if you already know that you have only ones of zeros, uh, the new bits that you receive will not give you any, any new information because you knew already that the probability was one of either getting one or zero. And the extreme case of maximum information is when you have the same probability of having ones or zeros. Like for example, it, uh, a random string or, or generated by a coin toss, uh, you can have a million bits, but that doesn't give you any information about what will be the next bit. So you toss coins, and that will give you maximum information because the probability is, is the same. That's more or less what uh, Shannon information tries to reflect. And if you plot it, uh, it has that L shape. Um, this would be the probability of X being one. So uh, if you have only only zeros or only ones, information is zero. If you have probability of one half of having one <coughs> or zeros, then information is maximum. Now, um, so much for information theory. Uh, complexity. Uh, as I said, it has plenty of definitions, but let's say to, to have a common ground of what uh, what we mean by complexity, uh, etymologically comes from the from the Latin plexus, which means uh, interwined or woven, which in Sanskrit is uh, also called tantra, uh, which basically gives us gives us an insight that something complex is something difficult to separate because you have uh, relevant interactions. These relevant interactions uh, are uh, make it difficult to separate because they have a causal effect on the components of a system. If you have relevant interactions, then it's difficult to, to separate. That's why you have complexes. And why is this important? Because uh, science since the times of uh, Galileo, Newton, Leibniz, Laplace has been reductionistic, which basically attempts to reduce components uh, isolate them in order to predict their behavior. But if you have relevant interactions, then this prediction will certainly be limited, if not inadequate. Uh, so let's say that's like a general notion of complexity. And as I was mentioning, you have dozens of measures, and 
we could categorize broadly between two different types of, of definitions of complexity. One associates complexity with the amount of information on, on a phenomena or on, on a bit string, which would be, for example, for more complexity, and uh, that sees random strings as being maximally complex. <coughs> you just need more information to describe a phenomenon, then the more random that phenomena is, you need more information because you cannot reduce the description of that phenomenon. And uh, of course, it's a particular scale because at different scales, the information will be different for describing the same phenomenon. And many people are not satisfied with this view of complexity because they say, well, that's, uh, that's more like noise because you, you have more complexity when you have random strings. Um, many people are interested more in complexity as balance between order and chaos, where chaos is more like uh, random strings, like uh, having no correlation between bits, maximum information, and order the complete opposite, and complexity somewhere in between. So, emergence, in many cases, it uh, takes an esoteric form, because many people use the concept without any let's say, a uh, clear notion of, of what it might mean. So um, many people would say, oh, when you speak about emergence, it's just something that you, you don't know. It's, it's just ignorance. The moment you learn about how things work, then it wasn't emergence. But let's say um, it, the, the clearer understanding of emergence is basically just properties or information that appears at one scale that is not present at different scales. So there's nothing esoteric, there's nothing ambiguous about it, and there's nothing about um, neither uncertainty or, or ignorance. It's just patterns that uh, appear at one scale that are not at a different scale, and that, that's it. Uh, for example, the properties of thermodynamics can be said to be emergent, for example, temperature, because you cannot reduce the temperature of a gas to the temperature of just one single molecule. It's reduced to the ensemble <coughs> modes, to, to the average uh, to kinetic energy. Or, for example, uh, you, you can have properties of gold. For example, it, it has color, conductivity, malleability. But you cannot deduce those properties from the properties of gold atoms. Uh, and you have also lots of examples in, in chemistry, in super, supramolecular chemistry computer science, uh, in biology, where you have patterns that you cannot really deduce from, from the behavior of the components. Other people have proposed to, to see emergence uh, as a change of description or as a meta model. Say so when you have, uh, uh, when you require a, a change of description or when scientifically you are better off with a change of description because it offers you better predictive power, then it's useful to speak about emergence. Uh, so for example, this is related to, to Chalice's notion uh, where he speaks about uh, efficiency of prediction. So he says if, if you are uh, more efficient predicting <coughs> phenomena at a particular scale, then uh, you, you have some sort of emergence. Uh, and he gives an example with thermodynamics because it's more efficient to predict changes in temperature, volume, uh, pressure than changes in kinetic energy or millions of molecules. And also there are different types of, of emergence, weak or strong, and also it has been proposed. Uh, I mean, this list is not exhaustively, but also comparing information at different levels. So if you have more information at a higher scale, then you can say that there's some information emerging from, from the interactions at the lower level. Another uh, concept that's commonly used in complex systems and it's very much related to this workshop is that of self-organization, which uh, could be defined as global pattern uh, emerging from, from interactions uh, of the components. So uh, if we also go to the etymology, well, uh, it's basically self-organization occurs when you have an increase of organization. And if we see your organization as order, then uh, the more uh, ordered a system becomes, then the more self-organized it becomes. However, some people see self-organization not as an increase in order, but as an increase in complexity or uh, as an increase in structure. 
Um, also, it's partially dependent on the observer because, as I've been noted, who uh, actually Rosashby was the first person who used the term uh, self organizing system. He, he mentions, well, imagine if you have a dynamic system, then uh, unless uh, you have a doubly stochastic matrix of, of the state transitions, then you will have uh, attractors. So if you call those attractors organized states, then the system will self organize towards the attractors. And if you decide to call the attractors disorganized states, then the system will self disorganize. Uh, so it's also a matter of when it's useful to speak about self organization rather than uh, whether a system is or not self organized. Homeostasis is uh, another concept that was very popular in cybernetics um, and has its roots in biology. And it's basically you know, kind of defined as the ability of, of an organism to maintain steady states of operation in view of internal and <coughs> external changes. And it's, it's very much related to robustness. Basically, uh, homeostasis is the ability to, to be within us, uh, to maintain your essential variables, as we really call them, within a certain range. So, of course, living systems do this. And we would like artificial systems also to, to have some sort of homeostasis. We shouldn't be confused with uh, a steady state, because in many cases, homeostasis is quite dynamic. I mean, just, uh, I mean, living systems are not static. They are in constant change to adapt to, to, to their requirements, to their environment. For example, uh, heartbeats are uh, far from being stationary or regular or static, but they are part of the homeostatic process, which is basically uh, what enables systems to, to endure. Um, autopoiesis was proposed by Maturana and Varela in, in the early 70s uh, as an attempt to define uh, life. So they say, well, a living system is one that basically produces itself. And I mean, the, the concept has been very useful, but uh, so far I haven't found any measure of, of autopoiesis. So most people were more interested in deciding whether a system is or not autopoietic. But if you have a measure of autopoiesis, you could see how this uh, property could increase depending on different changes in the system and its environment. And also to speak about the ways that we can scale. Okay, so now let me present some of the proposals that, that we've worked uh, using information theory. Uh, we can see emergence as information uh, at a higher scale that is not present at a lower scale. And if we see a system as transforming information from its environment, let's say from a computational perspective, uh, then we can see just compu uh, the computational process as transformation of information from inputs to outputs. So uh, we could say and define emergence as that information that's produced by the computational process carried out by a phenomenon or, or a system. So basically it's the, the ratio between the information that the system produces over the information that the system receives. So if the information, uh, if the system receives lots of information and doesn't come up with anything, then there's not much emergence. Basically, if, if the information coming out of the system is the same or less of the information coming into the system, then you, you say that there's not information emerging. But then if you have few information coming into the system and the system computes something, it transforms that information and produces more information than the one that came in, then you can say that uh, that information emerged uh, by the computational process. So the more uh, information comes out uh, related to how much information came in, then the higher the emergence. Well, I'm completely confused. Yeah. Uh, the main uh, uh, task of our brain is information compression. So E is always much, much, much smaller than one. Yeah. <coughs> I I never produce information. It, it, uh, I would say it depends at which scale do you measure this. Because if you if you measure it at the scale of uh, 
say, of pixels, uh, of, I, I don't know, the activation of, of uh, uh, cells in the retina, then indeed, uh, actually, it's more cell organization. Uh, uh, let me just bring all the definitions, and then with the examples, I, uh, it might clarify your, your concern. So, uh, I mean, a, a way of simplifying this is if we assume a random inputs, random inputs, uh, random strings have maximum information, so uh, it would just be one, then the emergence would be just how much information comes out of a system considering random inputs. Sorry, should we use Shannon's information yeah. in the simulation? Yeah. Now, uh, already all, uh, nine years ago, uh, with Francis Kelly, we, we uh, were exploring the notion of what when can we call system self-organizing. So there we already proposed that you can see self-organization, uh, well, let's say measure self-organization as how organization changes within a system. So if we see organization as the opposite of entropy and thus information, then the self-organization of a system would be uh, the difference between the information coming in and information coming out. So if you have lots of information coming in and few information coming out, then you have positive self-organization, and if you have more information coming out than the one uh, you get in, you have negative self-organization, meaning self-disorganization, which basically just checks what's the difference of information between the input and the output. If the information, if the information increases, you have disorganization, because channel information is associated with entropy or disorder, and if the information decreases, then you have self Organization, meaning you increase your organization uh, and order. And if we simplify again with the random inputs, then uh, self organization will be just one minus the, the output information, which is the, for this specific case, is the, the opposite of emergence. And now uh, we take the, the view of complexity as the balance between uh, order and chaos. And in this case, uh, with our definitions, emergence is uh, very much correlated with chaos and self-organization correlated with order. And uh, following uh, the, the measure of Lopez Ruiz, we can, uh, where they also uh, propose a statistical measure of complexity by multiplying um, entropy and uh, the, the measure of thermodynamical order, we also multiply this to, to find the balance. So some people uh, were wondering, well, how can you define emergence and self-organization as opposites if they usually come hand in hand? And it's precisely when you have high complexity that they come hand in hand. Because the extreme emergence is when you have lots of changes and say you, you cannot find much structure in there. And extreme self-organization is when you have no change at all. So then you can not have dynamics. And the balance where you have uh, some changes, structure changes, it's uh, precisely when you have high complexity. And again, if we simplify the input information uh, to, to see it as a random input, then uh, the complexity is simplified to, to, to this equation. Uh, A would be just a normalizing constant. If A is equal to 4, then complexity will be bounded between 0 and 1. And, uh, so you might notice that this is precisely the, the equation of the logistic map. Uh, we have no idea why this is the case, but it's, it might be just a coincidence. Uh, so here we can see a plot of, of the simplified versions of complexity, um, emergence, and self-organization. So uh, entropy, in this case, would be uh, shadow information. 1 minus general information will be the organization, and the multiplication would be uh, this complexity, which um, this might be related to some further thoughts because uh, this curve has similar shape to the feature information. Uh, we were discussing with Joseph why does this might be the case, and we didn't come up with any convincing answer it might also be a question. Now to, <coughs> to 
measure homeostasis, uh, we, we, took the, uh, we take the normalized Hamming distance. The Hamming distance basically checks how different two different strings are. Uh, it just counts how many different bits or symbols the strings have, and the more different, uh, the, the more difference, then the higher the distance. Uh, so homeostasis will be just one minus that, the, the, minus the Hamming, normalized Hamming distance. Uh, if two strings are equal, then homeostasis would be maximal. If uh, there's no correlation between those strings, the homeostasis would be 0.5. And if they are anti-correlated, it means that every bit is different. So one would be the negative of the other, and then homeostasis would be zero. Yes? I mean, if one get, uh, say, like a bit difference between two strings, I mean, it, 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 it seems like you just want to use um, the, uh, the Kamagorov information between two strings. I mean, because, like, so for example, the, the Hamilton's theory, if there's just a shift by one, you know, it's going to be really, really high, which I presume you don't want that. Right? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, so and if you're doing, doing, doing it um, the Kamagorov way, so, so I guess you do, so I guess you have strings A and B, you do the Kamagorov of A minus the Kamagorov of A given the string B. And um, so that way it's only a shift by one, you know, there's always oh, a little program with the one in there, and then it's done. So, yeah. I mean, this, I mean, that I mean, intuitively, that seems like that'd be like the behavior you would want instead of um, instead of normalized Hamming distance. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, th these measures are not tied to the specific uh, information measure that you use. Uh, I'm just presenting it this way because in the experiments I will show later, this is uh, say a, a good way of, of measuring things because you don't have shifts. The, the experiments are yeah, but that's the the dimensionality and the phase space of the input and the output data streams has nothing to do with each other, so I can't see how you can define uh, it. Sorry, here uh, you know, for the, uh, well, in the examples I will show it, 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 it will become clear why, why. Uh, no, but in general, we have a system that has a certain input data stream, yes, and a certain dimensionality output stream, which has nothing to do with each other. Yes. Uh, Actually, this might be better described not as the input and output, but uh, as, as successive states of the same system, or successive outputs of the system. Yeah. Um. Now, uh, if, if we see autopoiesis uh, in terms of information, then we, we can, uh, I mean, if autopoiesis is uh, Autopoietic systems are those which produce itself. You can ask how much of the information of a system is produced by the system and how much is produced by its environment. So you, you can measure this with uh, a measure we propose as uh, the life ratio, which is basically how much uh, the, the, the information of the system over the information over its environment. Uh, of course, this is a very, what we could call, naive approach because uh, it doesn't uh, notice the causality between information of the system and information of the environment, but it's a, a first approximation. Um, so the, the, this is a bit different with the, the other measures because we're not looking at how the information is processed, but how uh, which information is within the system and it's in its environment. Now, to take these measures to, to multiple scales, we can uh, <coughs> simply group bit strings, um, so for example, we have there a string in base 2, uh, and then we can change it to base 4 by taking uh, bits 2 by 2. So we take these two bits and change it to base 2, base 2 bits, and uh, sorry, to base 4. These two bits, these two bits, these two bits, these two bits, <coughs> and then we can do the same for, for higher bases. So like that, we can have uh, we can observe this, the same information at different scales. Uh, let's say with uh, for the granularity, and uh, to, to bound the, the information, to keep it bound between zero and one, we just divide it by by b, which would be the, the number of bits we we group, uh, and that bounds it between zero and one. And uh, there's a finite size effect for for short strings. Uh, I mean, this information you can see that it quickly uh, becomes uh, very short because here, for example, in base 256, 
you have 256 different symbols, but here you have only three symbols. So if you apply the Shannon information, uh, the probability of having uh, 253 symbols is, um, is zero. And then this symbol has probability of one half, and this two has probability of one part. So that's why the information is very low, because the, the strings become very, very short. But if you have long strings, so for example, uh, it's just a random string, so uh, just 20 bits. Uh, it has this information because it's random, so it's almost one. And then you just uh, increase the scale. And of course, it reduces because it's finite, but it doesn't reduce as fast as, as very short strings. Now, um, I, I, let me quickly speak about random Boolean networks and elementary zero automata, which will be systems that we will use to, to illustrate these measures. Random Boolean networks were uh, proposed by Stuart Kaufman in the, in the late 60s as models of genetic regulatory networks. So they're very abstract models. Uh, for Kaufman, uh, each node represents a gene, and then these genes affect each other somehow. Uh, in those, those days, they, they had no idea of how genes um, were affecting each other, how many there were, uh, but still that didn't prevent people for, uh, from theorizing which kind of uh, genetic networks a uh, living system should, should possess. Um, so since there was no information about how genetic networks uh, were uh, constructed, he just generated random networks for, for different ensembles. Uh, and they're random because you generate the connectivity in a random way and you also generate the, the, the function in a random way. You have um, There are also generalizations of sensor automata, and you have uh, n Boolean nodes uh, linked by k connection switch. And so, for example, this node O is uh, state is determined by nodes n and p, and so on. <coughs> this topology is generated randomly, and the state uh, of each node depends on the state of previous time step of other nodes. And once you generate the topology and the functionality, this remains fixed. So for example, this would be the lookup table which defines the functionality of each node. Uh, you just put all the possible cases of the inputs and randomly <coughs> generate the outputs with some bias. Um, here there is no bias, so you, you have the same probability of having one to zero, so this would be one functionality. And this is a typical dynamics that you get uh, from an initial state then you call it one attractor. Uh, say the black represents one or zero and, and white represents the, the other one. Uh, elementary cellular automata can be seen as particular cases of random plan networks where you have each node has exactly three neighbors and uh, these neighbors are uh, sorry, three inputs and these inputs are its neighbors. So there's a symmetric connectivity. All nodes have three inputs and also are inputs to three other nodes. Because in random Boolean networks, even when you fix, uh, for example, three uh, inputs for each node, it might be the case uh, that some nodes are inputs of any node or of ten nodes because precisely you generate this randomly. And also you have homogeneous functionality, meaning that you have the same lookup table for all, uh, for all nodes. So if you have uh, three inputs, you have 256 possible rules, which can be reduced to 88 equivalence classes. Um, uh, Wolfram categorized it into four different classes. Um, let's say class one, you have only uh, static uh, patterns, or very simple patterns. Class two, you have uh, nested structures. Class three, you have uh, so the random behavior, and plus four, you have um, context structure, uh, complex structures. So uh, let me show you the, the results for, for random Boolean networks. Uh, this would be uh, for varying the connectivity. It is well known that for higher connectivity, you have more chaotic dynamics. So if we look at the emergence, which would be the black circles, uh, for low connectivity, it's very low because you, you don't have much information change in, in the nodes. 
and then as you increase k, uh, it is, uh, grows considerably in the chaotic phase. And self-organization is, is the opposite. Uh, it reduces with k, and the balance complexity uh, is maximal uh, near the phase transition. It's a bit shifted to the right because there are finite systems, but um, it, it is well known that the most complex behavior of, of random neural networks is near the phase transition. For my thesis, it's also uh, reduced uh, towards the non-correlation um, uh, as the dynamic becomes more chaotic. And we performed similar ex experiments for, for different scales, but they didn't have more, much difference because so they are random networks, you don't have a uh, visible structure. But with cell elementary cellular automata, you, you will see uh, how these measures change uh, when you change the scale. So these are the same results, just uh, box plots, so that you can see the, the statistical variance. Uh, now, these are just some of the results we have for elementary cell automata. In the paper, we have more. But I, I just wanted to show briefly um, examples of four, four elementary cellular automata, each representative of one of the, of the different dynamical classes. Rule zero is, uh, <coughs> is very low. Uh, for any uh, initial state, it turns everything to zero. So you could say that not much happens. So the, the emergence is zero always, and the self-organization is uh, one always, because it's, no matter how much information you put into the system, you will get no information out of it. And the, therefore, the complexity here is also zero. And the common stages is always maximal, because uh, there's no change. Uh, rule one is uh, other behavior, but it generates a pattern that from initial conditions it starts alternating rows of ones and zeros. So for uh, when you measure only one bit at the scale of phase two, uh, you have very high emergence because the probability of having ones and zeros is uh, almost the same. So it, uh, it gives you very high information. Uh, therefore, low self-organization, and uh, it gives you actually uh, medium complexity. Uh, but then when you increase it to, to base four, you take uh, uh, rows two by two, then uh, if it's one zero, it will convert into two, 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 two. So then the information is minimal at higher scales, so it's easy to identify this uh, behavior which is complex only at one scale. Uh, on another hand, rule 110, which is uh, a common example of complex dynamics and also capable of universal computation, uh, uh, as you change the scale, uh, as you increase the scale, the emergence reduces and the self organization increases, and the complexity also increases. Um, mm -hmm. and but I, I'll better speak about my thesis uh, after I mention rule, rule 30, which is chaotic dynamics. It has always, for all scales, uh, high emergence and loss of organization and medium complexity. Well, uh, no, actually, it's, it's low complexity, and then here it starts to increase a bit because of finite size effect. And uh, for my thesis, for, for rule 30, uh, you have this curve uh, indicates where you have uncorrelated patterns. And you see that uh, rule 110 uh, is far from, from these non-correlated patterns. So in the paper, we explain this a bit more. It basically, it's an uh, insight of, of patterns that appear at that scale. Because, for example, you can have a, a tractor of period 4 and uh, if you measure the homeostasis at, uh, 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 with one bit uh, of scale, then you, you could get a very uh, low homeostasis because there will be change every, every two steps. Then if you uh, increase the scale, then that pattern of period four will be contained, uh, uh, will be just one single being repeated. Uh, however, if you have, let's say, period seven, then it wouldn't show as uh, a 
and it's not a multiple of uh, power of two. Uh, however, it shows in the conversations as being uh, anti-correlated patterns. Uh, and this is a property of rule 110 that you have gliders which are structures which are used to perform universal computation, but they interact over an ether, which is a regular pattern of period seven. Uh, precisely, when you take four bits at uh, base 16, uh, it's, there's a jump in the uh, in the homeostasis far from the from the amount you would expect from, from having no non correlation pattern. So you can also use this to, to detect non trivial dynamics. <coughs> now, uh, to, to measure autopoiesis of random Euler networks, this, this is something we're, we're just uh, starting to work with. We, we take um, two random Euler networks to, to simulate a system and its environment. So, <coughs> that you have a certain number of nodes for, 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 the, for the system, a certain number of nodes for the dynamics of its environment. And basically, we link them in such a way that the dynamics of the environment are independent of the dynamics of the system, but the dynamics of the system are linked to the dynamics of the environment. So, we have a random Euler network uh, which uh, is composed by n nodes representing the environment and it has a connectivity specific for that Euler network. And then we have a larger uh, network which would be uh, representing this, the this system and how it's affected by its environment, uh, which is, has a uh, number of nodes representing the environment affecting the system and the nodes of the system itself. And then a connectivity characteristic of the system. So we basically every time step we compute the dynamics of the environment, and then we copy the state of that network over the nodes of the of the um, let's say system Euler network. So these nodes that we copy into the, the, the other network will uh, which will be these ones will be interacting with these nodes depending on this connectivity. Uh, however, these nodes, even when they might affect these nodes, uh, uh, on the next time step, uh, these, these nodes will have their own dynamic uh, determined by, by, by this network. So it's like an environment just throwing information into this larger network, and we're interested in seeing how this information injected here determines the information uh, of the system itself. So. This, these are some results for, for this measure of autopoiesis for having 64 nodes as, as the system and 64 as the environment, uh, varying the, the connectivity of the environment and the connectivity of the system. So uh, let me explain the notation. Um, if it's red, uh, it's lesser than one, and if it's blue, it's greater than one. And uh, let's say if it's zero, then the, the size of the the circles uh, are, are reduced because we're interested in a basis of one because that would be the transition between the environment producing more information than the system and the, the system producing more information than the environment. So you have a basis greater than one, the system is producing more information than its environment and vice versa. So the greater the red circle it means it's closer to zero, it means that the environment produces more information of the system than the than the other way around. And well, here you see that it's very symmetric uh, because here, uh, let's say, if you have the environment would have chaotic dynamics, let's say high information, and the, the system would have low information, meaning that uh, high information of the environment and low information of the system gives you a low autopoiesis. And <coughs> Uh, on the other extreme, if you have complex dynamics, or, well, uh, better say chaotic dynamics or, of the system and uh, very ordered dynamics of the environment, then you have a higher basis because the information produced by the system is more, um, it, it, it's more than the information produced by, by its environment. And for, for these same networks, we can see uh, the emergence that increases more 
for the for the environment. Uh, I mean, it depends more on the environment. Uh, you can see here because I mean, there's more similarity by columns than by rows. So it means that the uh, environment determines more the complexity than synchronization and emergence and the homeostasis more than than the system. Which is just because of this asymmetry that the environment injects information into the system and in this model the, the system does not inject information back into the environment even when, let's say, in ecological networks the systems, the organisms do inject information back into the environment. And here we just change the size of the nodes. Now we have a larger environment and a smaller uh, system or organism and uh, it's, it's very similar results uh, qualitatively. Um, and the same for when we have, let's say, a small environment and a, and a larger system. Uh, only that here, um, with a larger system, then the, uh, these measures start to become more dependent on information of the system than on the environment, but still the environment uh, plays a relevant role. Now, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, in many cases complexity um, is, is seen as the amount of information. We believe that this is not properly char characterized. That, uh, why? Because uh, information can be seen as a balance between ones and zeros. The more balanced uh, <coughs> these are in a string, the more information you have. If you have only ones or only zeros, then you don't have balance, you don't have information. And, I mean, to have complexity as balance between ones and zeros might be not so useful as seeing complexity as a balance between emergence and self-organization, which would be like a second level, uh, because emergence represents a balance between ones and zeros, and self-organization represents that you have uh, static dynamics, with, uh, let's say, not one, only ones or only zeros, or in, in, in better terms, that you don't have much change. Um, and, and this is a, a very uh, direct uh, mapping of the balance between um, chaos and order, which is considered by many other measures of, of complexity, which are uh, much more com complex. Um, and then this might also be re related to, to the principle of, of computational equ equivalence, which uh, uh, was proposed by Wolfram where he said, well, uh, even when, for example, in elementary cellular automata we have four classes, uh, his conjecture is that you have only two types of dynamics. Either very simple and you can't do much with it, or you, can, uh, you are capable of universal computation. And it seems with this and other works, for example, what we presented two years ago at, at ESO, where, where you can have different techniques to guide the self-organization of, of, of the dynamics of systems into a particular region. Um, there are techniques where you can take chaotic dynamics the, uh, to, to have a high complexity, or, uh, well, you can use these or other measures of complexity as a guideline uh, to, to, to design systems and to modify systems to have this desired properties that seem to be uh, not necessarily uh, determine universal computation, but seems to be a, a necessity to, to have these properties for universal computation and, and for living systems. Basically, if you have very high emergence, let's say lots of noise, then you cannot you have any memory. I mean, you can have computation, but then uh, anything you compute will be destroyed. And on the other extreme, if you have very high self-organization, uh, you have a structure, but then you cannot modify it. And complexity is precisely the balance between these two extremes, where you can have certain memory, you can keep the solutions, but you can still keep on exploring. And finally, that's what life is all about, and also computation. Um, and also, an interesting thing that we notice is that the high complexity is correlated with a high variance of, of homeostasis. Uh, now, the, there are several lines we would 
would like to pursue as, as future work to explore the relationship between complexity and fission formation and logical depth and other measures of complexity. Uh, we're starting to, to apply these measures to, to real data. Um, uh, with a student, he, he's also starting to, to, to implement this with the Epsilon machines. Uh, with some colleagues, we might do this with Turing machines. Uh, it would be interesting to have analytical solutions for, for uh, the results we have. Uh, we are also working on a, on a new complexity profile that Varian uh, proposed a, a complexity profile, but where he sees complexity as the amount of information. If we see, uh, well, uh, like the profiles I show you for, for elementary general automata, they, they can give you uh, a nice feeling of how uh, different measures change across scale, and that's uh, very relevant because usually we just focus on one scale. And, uh, we see that it's not the whole story. Uh, we can also uh, study this uh, more generally in computing networks. So just to conclude, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, apart from the proposed measures of emergency organization, homostasis, complexity, and biases, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't intend to claim that these are like the, the real ones and all the dozens of previous measures of complexity um, are, are not useful. Actually, many of those are uh, very much related or specific cases of this. Uh, I think that the relevant thing is that we should start discussing uh, these questions um, in order to clarify uh, what we mean, not only to ourselves, but to other disciplines. Because if people start speaking about emergence and they have no idea what emergence is, then we don't really want to become associated with that people or with that concept. And that's what happened with cybernetics. People in social sciences started using concepts from cybernetics, uh, let's say without a clear understanding or let's say without a proper definition. And uh, then people who proposed those measures didn't want to become associated with that uh, loose use of their concepts. So they basically changed names and, and now we do complexity instead of cybernetics. Uh, so in order that that doesn't happen again, we need to have precise definitions and they should be simple enough so that people in the social sciences will be able to apply them to their systems. Uh, and it's also relevant because uh, I remember just uh, one or two decades ago in biology, um, let's say people were kind of neglecting many biological theories because they had no experimental data. For example, uh, I mean, still, w w when I was in university, it was almost ridiculous to think about making experiments of, of evolution. But in the la last decades, uh, many people uh, have done uh, experiments of evolution in vitro, uh, checking how uh, the, the genomes of different generations of bacteria change in, in time. Uh, so this data has uh, allowed them to contrast different theories that a couple of decades ago was not possible. And this is right now happening in social sciences. We're getting data to contrast <laughs> social theories. So uh, I think this type of measures will be useful for that type of data in order to, to contrast the theories that have already been proposed. But this will bring a, a solid scientific uh, grounding to, to social theories. And also, it's very attractive to, to use information theory for this because everything can be described in terms of information. Therefore, we can measure uh, the complexity, the emergence of organization, the basis of everything. So, I mean, it, it would be interesting uh, to, to measure what would be the basis of a country or an economy or uh, some molecules, uh, not necessarily in the context of biology. So, uh, if you have any, any questions, I'll be happy to ask. Thank you, Carlos. We have about 10 minutes for questions, please. Joe? Uh, Carlos, uh, one question I didn't ask you the other day when we were talking about this that uh, only really occurred to me now. When you were showing the results for CAs, you mentioned, uh, mentioned about the rules that had gliders. Yeah. Now, gliders are, are a feature of CAs that are attracted a lot of attention when people are using the terms emergence and self-organisation. 
So I wondered if you could interpret some of the results there about what we might expect to learn about how we could categorise gliders in terms of self-organisation and emergence because just looking at the results, it wasn't immediately clear to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, from these rules, rule 110 is the only one which has gliders. Uh, so the, the possibility of having gliders, which are basically uh, persistent structures in time, um, they can be, let's say, static without change, or uh, in many cases, they're also moving uh, across space. Um, they can exist because there's an ether. Um, if there's no ether, well, ether is basically a regular pattern that doesn't interact with the gliders. So the gliders interact with each other, but they don't interact with the ether. Uh, and if you don't have an ether, it means that you have chaos because the gliders will interact with whatever structure, and, and then they, they are destroyed. So uh, the, the, this is obvious here. Uh, for, for homeostasis, where it gets uh, far from, from the non-correlated measure, uh, what you would expect for, uh, for a scale that for the scales which are greater than the period of the laser. And another thing is that uh, you see that um, the, the emergence is reduced with scale, and for chaotic rules, it doesn't. Uh, it reduces with scale because it means that gliders have a particular scale. In, in rule 110, I, I, I think you have some gliders which are periods 7 and others, I think 15. I, I don't know, there, there are lots of different types of gliders and they have different periods. But then what you see is that uh, only when you move across scales is that you start detecting them. Because if you just look at one scale, you say, well, yeah, it, it has ha a, a high emergence. Uh, and if you want to compare it with a rule that doesn't have gliders, like rule 1 or rule 30, it doesn't give you enough information. So even if you decide not to use channel information, I think it's very relevant to, to look at the same measures at different scales and see how this changes, because this is very clearly separating the different types of, of elementary cell automata. At, at least for these cases, there are some uh, specific rules that by their configuration, uh, you, you get something different. Like, for example, there are regular patterns that are diagonal. And since we're measuring vertically the information, uh, you, you get as if there is lots of change, only that this change is uh, more fictitious. Uh, but then if you change your measurements and measure diagonally, then you get uh, similar results to this one. Yes? <coughs> Association between emergence and chaos. Yeah. We've been a couple of times. I mean, everything else, very beautifully presented. I want to congratulate you. Thank you. Just that association, can you help me? Yeah. Two of the chaos. So. So, the, 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 the definition of emergence is how much information comes out of the system uh, compared to how much information comes into a system. So in, in a, the maximally emergent uh, system uh, would be one in which no matter with, whether you put few or less information, you get lots of information coming in. And the maximum information in terms of Shannon is presented when you have random strings, or so, pseudo random strings, uh, more, more specifically. And precisely chaotic dynamics uh, are uh, similar to, to, to random strings. When you look at uh, the states of nodes in time, uh, you don't see patterns because there are so many interactions going on and they're affecting each other, so, so you lose track of a of pattern. Uh, yeah. So you're saying it's more <coughs> characteristic of the input than the No, it, it's more of the output. More of the output because it doesn't matter whether you put few or lots of information, you get lots of information out of it. I mean, the, the, the maximum value is when you put very, very little information and you get a lot of information. But also, if you put a lot of information and that information is not reduced, then that's also a characteristic of chaos. Because uh, if you put noise into a system and you get out of that system 
uh, structure, then you are re reducing the information, uh, and that wouldn't be uh, that would be let's say reducing the chaos that you put into the system, uh, and that would be more self organization. I will following up on this uh, question, um, there is a definition of uh, emergence by Shalizi in computational yeah. mechanics where they define essentially this as a ratio between uh, what can be predicted uh, over, I mean, uh, or what, what is predicted over what would in principle be predicted, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, efficiency of prediction. I think this uh, definition actually would uh, clash with your definition. If you cannot reconcile it, I think, it would point in the opposite extremes. That's why I think this is related to previous question. I mean, uh, in, in chaotic or random systems, it's very difficult to argue that emergence goes very high. I mean, what you explained obviously concurs with your measure, yeah. but whether this is uh, really emergence as understood in this tradition yeah. is a big question. So I'm just wondering why did you go this way? You could have probably used either Kolmogorov complexity as a multiplier or maybe yeah. simply entropy rate. It yeah. would give you the same uh, quadratic thing. Is, is that, well, uh, uh, because it also clashes with Shalisi's definition of self-organization. Mm. So let's say for Shalisi, you have increasing emergence, let's say here you will have Maximum complexity, and here you have increasing self organization. So That's there, right. are there are ma maximal yeah. at, uh, at the same point. Yes, at the, com at the complexity point. Yes. And, and for us, it's more like. Uh, yes, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are you sure that under Shali the self organization doesn't go? to infinity at the other case? Uh, well, is that he, me he measures self-organization as an increase in complexity. Ah, okay. So, but so anyway, then I, I understand that. But I mean, I'm just wondering why didn't you, why did you need to link it with emergence and not say uh, use Kalmagorov complexity, which has a very nice and mathematically well-defined, uh, you know, profile, which goes from low order yeah. in order to high in cal. Yeah, what is that? We're trying basically to, to formalize this intuition of, of emergence as information produced by a system that was not beforehand. So that's why we just link the output of the system uh, uh, towards its inputs. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand it, and, but I mean, it, it probably if you use, for this case, if you use feature information instead of channel information, probably you will get something like that. Well, that, that I don't know. Uh, I mean, so you're making a principle to choice here, right? So you, you yeah. really want to say that emergence is the highest in the chaotic regime because information produced by the system relative to the input information yeah. is the highest. And, and we call that emergent information. It's an information that... Yeah, well, maybe I could call it emergent information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We need to talk more about that because I'm, I'm still unconvinced that an ontological status of this yeah. is, is correct here. But I mean, as a mathematical construct, yeah, you could call this ratio whatever you want and put it in complexity formula, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I have uh, also a follow-up question for the term of self-organization. So it seems that your measures are are very much for, like, uh, this type of, uh, of experiment you described. So I would like to get a little bit more intuitive grasp. For example, take uh, we take a stone and we take a flock of birds, okay? Yeah. So the stone has, it doesn't matter what you throw in, information output zero, so maximum self-organization in your, in your way. This I don't really see. And then I have a flock of birds. First of all, I need to a little bit think what, what would be the input and the output. Say the input is some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, deviation of the positions or something of the birds, and then the output is the position of the birds, I don't know. Or maybe the input is a position in the output. I don't know what, what you would define, and then um, it wouldn't be maximally self-organized. Uh, so I, I really don't. Maybe you can comment on this, on this yeah. example or something a little bit because I really struggle to understand. Yeah, for the flock of birds, uh, I, I would assume that let's say better a simulation of a flock of birds because that's yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I'm fine with that. But. 
So, so you can assume that you start with, with random initial conditions. Mm -hmm. So that will give you maximum information. And then as this, uh, the birds interact or, or voids interact, then uh, they acquire certain pattern. Mm -hmm. So that gives them certain self-organization, but they do not crystallize into a cluster. So that would be, let's say, not maximum self-organization. That would be maximum co complexity. Yeah, so, okay, and, so and, and the rock, I, I mean, I, I understand your point, but I don't. I mean, see the, the, the rock is a little bit, a little bit of the idea of this like uh, uh, fixed attractor. So it, yeah. it, it take, take the flock of birds, you start them randomly, they all collect to a single point, that's it. Yeah, final. I, I and then you would say this maximum self organization, and I would guess that most of the people in the room would not agree, but. Uh, or at least, uh, yeah. I, I, think I, I mean, is that the rock? I, I, I don't see clearly what would be the input and the output. Maybe a crystal would be a better example of something. Yeah, crystal would be better. Example. That you can start randomly and then it gets uh, into a fixed mm -hmm. state. Configuration, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I would call. I, I would say that the crystal self organizes more than the flock of birds, mm -hmm. but also you need to to keep in mind at which scale you are comparing them. Because you can have the same system that self-organizes at one scale and self-disorganizes at different scales. I, I think all these questions come from uh, really terminological uh, concerns. Yeah. Yeah. If you just call it an index for chaos, an index for order, and have you measure as the multiplier of two, no questions. But once yeah. you attach labels, index for chaos is emergence and index for order is self-organization. Uh, is that actually it came the other way around? Because we're interested in, okay, how can we come up with a general intuitive mathematical description of what we believe uh, characterizes emergence and self-organization. And later it's turned out that it's related to, 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 America, to order ca chaos, chaos and, and order. Yeah, yeah just, just very quickly, I think also that the terms are kind of confusing. Uh, because you use basically your term for information is the same as the entropy that Shannon used to say. So it's kind of disorder, basically. And yes. you call this disorder immediately information, while, while some use information only for reduction of uncertainty yes, exactly. and then call this different information rather than the, the actual state. Because if I look at your, your process, because then people would also say that if you have like a Markov chain of computation, you cannot increase information. Uh, but only like lose it. But of course, if you define information just as entropy, you can have a process that no matter what comes in, always outputs random, and that would be high emergence for you. So any process that just gives random outputs has emergent properties, while on the other hand, if you have a process that maps everything to a one, so no matter what input comes in, uh, you map it to one that's self-organization then. Yeah. And that it's a little bit counterintuitive, yeah, I, I, I find, I, I, I agree it's calling that, information I, then. I agree that it indeed, indeed is counterintuitive, but it's what you, what we got, let's say, from taking to the extremes uh, what we thought it was true. I think this explains it clearly because, it, uh, let's say, this is more intuitive. And you have maximum emergence of organization and complexity at the same point. But then uh, that kind of prevents you from speaking about emergence at this uh, in this part, and speaking about self organization, this part. Mm. And like this, you can relate them more. Uh, I mean, I mean, but I think the stock you can multiply two mutual informations instead of multiplying two entropies, which I think was what we used yeah. to be more standard. That's a good point, yeah. You, 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 you could reformulate <coughs> it into mutual informations and still get the same index, yeah. Right. Um, I would. I would be a little bit doubtful because, as I said, there's this process idea of doing computation and you have an input and an output. And uh, if your information is a mutual information about some kind of external variable or, you know, your stores information about it, you cannot increase the mutual information through a computation process. Yeah, we need to sit down and write down the formula, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I do, just, just to follow it up, I do like the idea of the complexity of basically the multiplication of those two terms. I'm much more worried about the their separate usage. Yeah. I mean, calling the, the self-organization of the emergent terms by itself, I, I find very doubtful. The, the complexity in itself is, is something much more interesting to look at, I would say. Okay, right.
Okay, we we have now break um, for 20 minutes and we'll resume at 11 o'clock. So let's thank Carlos once more.